Oh, look, you can see the big blue crab. Look, there it is. Right here? Yes, look, look right wow. just below where oh, I am. Oh, no, whoa. Do you see how large his claw is? Yes. Look, there it is. Wow. Oh my gosh. Oh, no way. <laughs> that was so cool. It was huge, it was pretty that big. That was big. I'm out here on the Brooklyn waterfront sporting the latest in bright orange life jacket fashion to see something that could help protect New York from the next big hurricane. That's a big oyster. Yeah. That's a pretty big oyster. Tanasia here is part of the Billion Oyster Project, an organization that wants to grow just ungodly amounts of shellfish and use them to make New York Harbor less frighteningly polluted. So oysters are filter feeders. So these oysters here are actually helping to filter the water that's here. That's why they taste um, so good. <laughs> They're also lending their oysters to a project called Living Breakwaters, which is taking an unorthodox approach to protecting coastlines from the next superstorm. It's just one of many ideas people are coming up with to protect coastal cities from the effects of climate change as rising seas and stronger storms threaten to make hurricane sandy level flooding much more frequent. And it's part of a much bigger conversation about reimagining what climate adaptation looks like so that both humans and the ecosystem around us can not just survive the future, but hopefully thrive in it. So the water here got up to about four feet during Sandy, which is right about here. Hurricane Sandy crashing on shore, winds now at 90 miles per hour. Sandy left a growing toll today, at least $20 billion or more in damage. This is Alphabet City, which is the part of the East Village that's closest to the water. This neighborhood got hit hard when Sandy came through. These streets were all underwater, and on top of that, almost everyone south of the Empire State Building lost power for days, so this all went dark. It's hard to imagine. You, you don't really think about New York City streets underwater, unless you were here for it, in which case you probably still think about it a lot. Bar owner Zach Mack opened his business in the East Village just a few months before Sandy hit. This is a picture taken, it's on the corner over here, of the flood oh, that happened. Oh, man. Yeah. You can see, like, it's above the hoods of the cars and... Wow. Yeah. The next day I came here to, to check everything out. It was kind of surreal, Walking Dead vibes on the street, just cars kind of abandoned with, like, the doors open and yeah. the water had receded, but I went to open up our hatch. And the first thing I saw were kegs floating by. Oh. And I was like, yeah. It was very clear that it wasn't just like, oh, everything's gonna go back to normal right now. We spent the, la the next few days kind of digging out. I learned how to siphon gas out of a car because we needed to run the sump pumps to keep the basements clear. Such a New York story. You yeah. like, jacked people's gas. They come back to try to move their cars. Yeah, no, like, these ones. Sorry, these here's ones some were, beer. The, the, all the ones that we saw, these are the ones that were like, had been destroyed. Like, sure. These ones are gonna get yeah. towed away. So, yeah, it was one of those weird uh, survival experiences I wasn't quite yeah. expecting, again, five months into business. It wasn't like in probably about a year until things started to feel like relatively normal again. A, a whole year after? Yeah. Is there a point after which you wouldn't be able to do this? Meaning, let's say we got to the frequency of there's, there's, a, there's a Sandy every three years or four oh, yeah. years instead of every 10. I think if we're looking, even if it ever happened once again, that's a serious conversation. But... If it were to happen, especially like every three years, there's no way. So there are a few projects in the works that are designed to keep the water out next time. One is called the Big U, which would raise a lot of the land around the perimeter of lower Manhattan to try to reduce flooding. There's another idea to build this massive $100 billion seawall that could close off all of New York Harbor from the ocean when the next big storm comes along. And I think most people hear about ideas like that and they go, well, yeah, sure, we gotta keep the water out somehow, right? Oceans are rising, storms are getting stronger, let's build some walls. But some people are pretty critical of that approach and there's another solution in the works that's maybe not what you'd expect. 
one of the things that happened in the wake of Sandy is we wanted to figure out how we could keep the water out, right? But this is New York. Water is part of who we are. It's the economic, cultural history and identity of the city. It's a part of the ecosystem. Um, and that was the lens that we took. This is Pippa Brashear, a landscape architect at the design firm Scape. She's working on a project called Living Breakwaters that's been about 10 years in the making. The Living Breakwaters project, the idea came about in the wake of Hurricane Sandy. It is a string or necklace of breakwaters. These structures of rock in the water, about half mile long, off the south shore of Staten Island, that will reduce risk to the shoreline from erosion and storm waves and help restore ecosystems. How does that stop waves? How does that protect where people live? So breakwaters, they do what they sound like. They break water. So before waves reach the shore, they break them. And that helps erosion because that's caused by many daily waves over time. Now, during storms, we get even larger waves, right? And so some of these breakwaters are tall enough to really knock down those waves before they reach the shore. And that's really important in a place like Staten Island because the South Shore, waves just came directly in. And so all of New York was flooded, but the South Shore of Staten Island and the Rockaways were pummeled with waves. You saw houses destroyed. And in Tottenville, two lives were lost because they were literally swept out to sea. So it's one thing to be flooded. It's another thing to just have the wave action on top of that. But uh, last fall, we started construction and we just finished the first breakwater. Some of the other solutions that we've heard, everything from like what sounds almost science fiction, you build these massive doors to stop water. Um, how does your plan or the plan that you're working on factor in with those other yeah. proposals? I think one of the things that we often try to do and compare, try to work, compare ourselves to the Dutch, maybe engineer a mm. giant gate on New York Harbor and keep all the water out. Well, that, I mean, you talk about our project taking 10 years, that's probably gonna take 50 years, right? To get all the political buy-in, to figure out how to pay for it. And it's probably gonna fundamentally change the ecology of the harbor. So we didn't think, a lot of our partners didn't think that was the right solution. Critics of the big wall say that cutting the harbor off from the ocean could be catastrophic for wildlife throughout the region. Living breakwaters, by contrast, wouldn't destroy habitats, it would actually create one. So what we see in Raritan Bay, where the breakwaters are located, that's the lower New York Harbor, is it used to be flush with oyster reefs. But over time, we lost those reefs due to overfishing, dredging, water quality. To turn that around, Living Breakwaters plans to seed millions of oysters on specially designed blocks throughout their artificial reefs. The idea is that a whole habitat will form around them, providing even more resistance in the water to help slow down waves. There's just one question. Where are you gonna get all those oysters? Can you tell me about the Billion Oyster Project? What is it, what do you do? Yeah, so the Billion Oyster Project is a nonprofit and our mission is to restore oyster reefs to New York Harbor through public education initiatives. So we're trying to replenish them, not necessarily for consumption, but for the ecosystem benefits. So Living Breakwaters Project, the idea is that this will be filled with oysters. It's going to be a living barrier, so a living reef. And so we were able to partner with Scape to bring the oysters to that site. So if you're ready, I think we can pull yeah, up some oysters. Let's. All right. We're just gonna give that a wiggle and pull it up. We can walk it over to awesome. shore. Look at these little crabs in here. Yeah, so these are different mud snails, or mud crabs, rather. You can see one here. There we go, and this one's a male. Um, you can tell because the abdomen has more of a- Six pack. Elongated, <laughs> more of an elongated uh, abdomen. This is sea lettuce. Yep. We have sponges here. These red things are tunicates. Do you put these here or do they just yep. sort of show up? They essentially grow as we, so when we put these reefs out, they look like bare rebar and metal structures. With then oysters with time, in them. With oysters yeah. in them, exactly. And then with time, these organisms essentially start to gather and create a home on okay. these reefs. 
There is one big caveat to all this. The living breakwaters won't totally stop flooding from a major storm. They'll basically just slow it down. Incoming waves hitting the barriers will lose a lot of their destructive force, reducing the impact on waterfront communities. But some water will still get in. That might sound like a pretty big strike against this approach. But the thing is, big walls won't necessarily stop the flooding either. One of the things that we always talked about with the breakwaters was people were like, well, it won't keep the water out. Shouldn't we build like a berm instead? Well, it's like, if you build a wall this high, what if the water is six inches higher than everyone behind it just got flooded? Yeah. And what do you do? And so the breakwaters, while they don't keep water out like that, they're still gonna function even if the water's high, right? They're still gonna knock down waves. So are any of these solutions enough or is there a reality that we're just gonna have to learn how to live with rising sea levels? We definitely have to learn to live with rising sea levels. How we live on the water is gonna have to change. Water levels are gonna be higher. We might have to evacuate more. Storms are gonna be more often. And I think that the change part is actually the hardest part about designing and planning for climate change. Because people wanna think there's an infrastructural solution that's gonna allow my life to be exactly what it is today, tomorrow. What we really need to do is envision futures with that climate change where we're living and thriving, where there's high quality of life and start to give people a picture of that. Life might be different, but we like it. You know? It's something that we're moving towards rather than this scary thing mm. that we're running from. And we as a society, we can step down the risk and think about those other things that we're gonna do to adapt and live with a changed future.